Hey everyone, welcome back to our Bible study. So I'm on uh, at a conference this week, so I had to uh, find a room here, uh, and it's it's uh, it's gonna work. This this is gonna be good. Um, so here we are, uh, getting into the Word of God. The Word of God. I just think of this a lot uh, from last week. The Word of God is not changed. It's not chained. Excuse me. The Word of God is not chained. Beautiful line, I think. Just to reflect, you know, no matter where we're at, you know, if we're at a conference, if we're at home, if we're at work, you, you know, we have a couple of minutes for a break, you know, we can get into the Word and spend that time letting the Word of God have free reign over our hearts. What a, what a beautiful thing that is. Uh, and, and for the Lord to see that, you know, for, you know, God, God sees all things. One of my favorite, we're getting off a little tangent here, but uh, one of my favorite uh, names, titles of God um, is Adonai El Roy, the Lord, the God who sees. Uh, to trust that, that when I take those little breaks during my day to just be with the, the Lord in prayer, in scripture, in study of some sort in in performing an act of of righteousness uh you know an act of love toward my neighbor or toward the lord whatever it may be he sees all of that uh and he delights in it you know he delights he you know just like just like any father you know would be so proud uh if he sees one of his children um doing something that that he had taught that child you know uh and the child unknowingly seeing, like, not knowing that the father is watching. You know, what a, what a beautiful thing that is. And so the, the same for the Lord uh, and same, the same for us. When, when we do things, engage in life the way that Jesus or the way that the father or the way that the Holy Spirit inspires within us, they just, they delight in that so much. Um, our God delights in, in seeing us act like we're his children. Beautiful. Okay, let's get into the word. Um, so our first reading today is from the book of Exodus chapter 17. So just a little bit of background before we get into the reading. Um, so we know in chapter 14, they, this is when Moses leads them across the, the Red Sea um, on dry land and the Egyptians are drowned. We know then in chapter 15, they sing the song of great joy and rejoicing. We know uh, then right after this, they begin to complain against the Lord, even though they had seen him perform all of these mighty works, they complain against him. Um, and then the Lord provides, he provides quail for them to eat. And then he provides manna, this flaky bread like stuff that they uh, have every morning, every morning they have this. Uh, and then in chapter 17, they complain again. And so the Lord provides for them water from a rock. Uh, the, Moses simply strikes a rock and the rock brings out water uh, miraculously, right? It's amazing. And then right after this scene uh, comes our first reading, which maybe isn't necessarily connected, but I think it's just important uh, for us to know that this is, this is while they're in the desert, before they reach the promised land uh, that God wants to give them, which of course we know they're in the desert for 40 years. Um, but up to this point, there's, it's still fresh. You know, there's still just a few days or maybe a few months. I don't, I don't know how much time has passed, but uh, still, still fresh in the desert uh, on their way to the promised land. So our Exodus chapter 17, we're going to be verses 8 through 13. So like we've been doing, I'll read the passage from this Bible here and uh, then just share some insights, which I think are there's, there's some really cool uh, insights and a new kind of idea that, that I'll share with, with us this morning. So first, getting into the reading. At Rephidim, Amalek came and waged war against Israel. Moses therefore said to Joshua, Pick out certain men, and tomorrow go out and engage Amalek in battle. I will be standing on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him. He engaged Amalek in battle after Moses had climbed to the top of the hill with Aaron and Hur. As long as Moses kept his hands raised up, Israel had the better of the fight. But when he let his hands rest, Amalek had the better of the fight. Moses' hands, however, grew tired, so they put a rock in place for him to sit on. Meanwhile, Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and one on the other, so that his hands remained steady until sunset. 
And Joshua mowed down Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. All right, so just take a moment here. Let's just, just think for a minute. What is it that catches your attention in our word? What is it that strikes you? Any questions that come to your mind? Now, I'm not, I'm not going to answer all of the questions, but in my study uh, this week, I, I think there's just some really cool things that are going on. So um, uh, a common way that Christians have, have read the scriptures, especially reading the Old Testament, looking ahead to the New Testament, is, is this word, it's called typology. So a type, or uh, a lot of times, um, maybe in modern day language, we use foreshadowing. Uh, but it's, it's not quite the same, but, but similar, uh, a, a similar concept, right? So the author might write about something that foreshadows, that looks ahead to something that is to come later on in the story. So for us, uh, the Lord will sometimes uh, have events take place that actually point directly ahead to something that's going to take place in the future. Um, there are people in the scriptures and the events that occur in their lives that are, are typological. They're a type of what is to come in the person of Jesus. Um, so it's it's like we look, so we'll, we'll point out some examples here. Okay, so so just to rehash, right? So Moses, uh, it, th there's people who want to wage war against Israel. So Moses and Joshua are coming up with their, their game plan, their, their battle plan. What are we going to do? And it's kind of a strange battle plan, right? It's, it's like, okay, uh, you go into battle and I'm going to go up on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. Uh, so Moses, what's what's Moses' plan? I'm just gonna go watch. <laughs> yes, it's kind of a strange thing, but this this is really important. We have to remember what does he have? He has the staff of God, and if he has the staff of God, the staff is the symbol of authority. Right? Think of think of a shepherd. If the shepherd has his staff, this is this is his symbol of authority over the flock. And sometimes he actually uses that staff. You know, if, if predators come, he's going to go out there and he's going to use his staff to try to ward them off, you know. Um, or if the, if the sheep uh, are wandering away from the fold, he's going to use his staff either to hit them or to, you know, guide them back toward the flock. You know, so this, like, this is what he does with the staff. So it's not just that Moses is going to watch, you know, to see how things play out, but he's going to, he's going to keep an eye on the battle with the authority of God. Uh, that's that's an important thing. Okay, but that, that's not necessarily the typology there. Um, although maybe it could be in some ways, you know, how, how we know Jesus. Uh, he, we, can, we can sometimes think that he's, he's so distant from us. Uh, but again, if we believe the Lord, the God who sees, that he sees, that he doesn't just see me as this sort of like distant uh, observer, but, but that he's, he's seeing me with his authority. And so I can trust that that even if I don't feel his presence or I don't feel his vision on me, uh, that he's watching me and he's doing it with his staff in hand. So I guess that's a really good example. Uh, that's pretty cool just as we're, as we're doing this. Okay, so anyway, so then what happens? So Joshua goes and he engages in battle uh, after Moses climbs. And then Moses has Aaron and Hur on his, on his sides here. And then as long as Moses kept his hands raised up, so what would that look like? Some, something like like this, so maybe my image isn't isn't quite uh, big enough, right? So, so something like this, which we ask yourself the question, like what what is what does this look like? Well, maybe it looks like Jesus on the cross, right? Uh, and so as long as Moses kept his hands are outstretched like this, uh, what happens? The battle goes favorably for Israel. And we know this, like Jesus, right, as long as he keeps his hands outstretched, as long as he stays on the cross, dying for our salvation, what happens? Well, the, the battle goes well for us as humans. Right? So, like, and then, and then when Moses' hands come down, the battle doesn't go as well. He looks and, and the, the Amalekites have the better of the battle. And so the same for Jesus, right? Like, with, without Jesus' death on the cross... And resurrection, we know this, but without his death on the cross, what happens? Our, our battle against the world, the flesh, and the devil, it, it doesn't go well. But, but if we see Jesus uh, dying for us on, on the cross, then, then we have a chance. And not just that we have a chance, but that, that somehow when he does this, he empowers us 
to win the battle. And it's not that we're, we're winning on our own, but, but it's, it's that his power somehow is at work in, in his hands, stretched out for us, dying on the cross. So this is a type. So Moses in, in this scene is a type of Jesus uh, to come. And it, it, it actually gets better, right? So, uh, so Moses, his hands get tired, of course, as you can imagine, right? Try to hold your hands out like this for a long time. Uh, your, your shoulders are going to get tired. And so you're going to want to, you want to drop. And so what happens? He needs, he needs help. And so he has these, these two people, uh, Aaron and her, um, on, on his sides, supporting him one on one side and one on the other so that his hands remain steady until sunset. Uh, what, what do we see Jesus doing on the cross? Now, these, these men are not supporting his hands, but nonetheless, Aaron and her, one on one side, one on the other. So too, Jesus had two men that he was crucified with, right? One on one side, one on the other. Jesus was in the middle of, of the three, of the two. Uh, so I, I think just, it's just another, and like I said, that the type, typology isn't always a perfect match, but I think, I think any, this, I think the Lord in hindsight, right? So at the time this was written, the crucifixion had not happened yet. And so we would be foolish to say, well, the Lord is already uh, reminding us to think of the crucifixion. Well, that's not necessarily the case. But God knows all things as, as being present. So he certainly knew when he inspired the divine author to write this passage that, that there was going to be a connecting point, a, a type, uh, a, a fulfillment of the type coming, coming up, which is, of course, Jesus. Uh, and and what, is that, what does that say for us? Well, it says that we need the Lord's power to win any kind of battles, whether it's a battle against flesh and blood, like, like Moses with the Amalekites, or maybe we could say, more importantly, a battle against the, the principalities and the powers of this world. That is, the, the battle against Satan and his minions. That, that on our own, we, we can't do this. But if we have the Lord's assistance, if we have the staff of the Lord uh, as he's watching from the heavens, and, and ultimately, we believe this, that Jesus, he's with us all the time. He says this in the Gospels. So it's not just that, that he's watching from the heavens, but that somehow he's, he's standing right next to me as I engage in battle with, with the world, the flesh, and the devil. Uh, and, and that he sees me, and he's got his staff in hand. You know, he's, he's got his power. Uh, his power, which, by the way, is, is proven, proven, not in his death. His death is essential but in his resurrection, right? Without the resurrection, his death doesn't mean anything. But, but with the resurrection, then it's like, okay, he is who he says he is. And so suddenly his death, it actually has, has incredible significance and incredible value uh, for, for me and, and for the world, for that matter. Um, so anyway, I, it's, it's really beautiful, really beautiful uh, writing here. Um, okay, so now, what this I think gets really, really greatly into our psalm here. So Psalm 121. Um, again, I've, I've, I mention this every time. I'll probably continue to mention it. Um, the psalm, is, it's not just like one continuous psalm that we hear at Mass, but oftentimes it's like verses, and they're broken up into stanzas, as we know, and, and then there's the psalm response itself. So anyway, so Psalm 121, which, uh, so not every Bible title gives titles to the psalms, but, but this New American Bible does, uh, and it's, it, the title is, The Lord My Guardian which I, I think is just, it's a really nice title, you know, and it fits in with, like, what, what's going on here. Well, it's not Moses and Joshua and the Israelites that, that win the battle by themselves. They only win the battle because the Lord is guarding them. Uh, and and this is this is our, our response, which comes from, or is inspired by verse 2, uh, our help is from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Uh, Psalm 2 is, uh, or excuse me, verse 2 in Psalm 121 is, is more individual, personal, but nonetheless it's the same, right? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, which, which is absolutely true, you know? I think, I think it's, it's just a beautiful thing for us to embrace in humility uh, on my own. I can't do it, but I know that with the Lord, he, he can. You know, he's, he is the one who gives me my help. He's the one who makes heaven and earth. And, and so if he makes it, surely he can help me overcome whatever spiritual battles uh, I need I need to overcome you know a, a beautiful thing and so what so what do we what do we do then when we encounter spiritual battles well I lift up my eyes toward the mountains whence shall come from my where where shall my my help come from 
Well, my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, right? So this is what I do in times of difficulty, in times of trial, in times of temptation. Again, whether it's a spiritual temptation or even physical trials, what do I do? I lift up my eyes to the heavens because the Lord is the only one who's going to be able to help me. Right? And I, I know this from my experience. I know this from, from the life of Jesus that simply keeping our eyes fixed on heaven doesn't mean that we're going to escape every worldly trial that we encounter, but, but it helps us to understand that, that somehow this worldly trial that we're encountering, it, it's going to play out in some way for our spiritual benefit. Um, I, I can trust and I can believe that that spiritual temptations and spiritual battles the Lord is going to help me to overcome because he doesn't want me to sin and he empowers me actually to overcome the enemy just like he empowered Moses and Aaron and the Israelites to overcome the enemy uh, in a spiritual way we have that power uh, and so I as I as I lift my eyes to the heavens if it's if it's like a temptation towards sin that I'm facing I don't I don't have to sort of have this this cowardly disposition that says, well, I look to heaven and Jesus didn't help me, so I better sin. No, and in fact, in a spiritual temptation kind of way, it's a very real thing. I lift up my eyes to the heavens and I realize that the Lord has empowered me so that I don't, I don't have to sin. Again, it's not my own power that, that makes it so I don't have to sin, but it's the power of Jesus Christ crucified and risen from the dead. Uh, so, so in a very real way, I lift up my eyes to the heavens. From where shall come my help? My help comes from the Lord the maker of heaven and earth. Beautiful, beautiful psalm. Um, so anyway, there, there we go. I, th I think there's just a lot of richness uh, in our first reading here, and uh, I'm delighted to share this with you. So I'll see you guys again uh, for our next session on the gospel. God bless you.